to get it so they're drinking urine and, and feces. That's, that's the most insane, evil thing, man. What's up? What's up? What's up? How you doing, Jay? I'm doing great, man. How are you? Let me get it off of double screen here. There we go. <clears throat> we are live, uh, and I'm sorry. I, I, I'm always messing up time zones. I don't understand how they work. I don't know what they are. People exist no in it. You you no exist. Worries. You exist in the future. I exist in the past somehow. I don't know how it works, but <laughs> you yeah, can. Yeah. You can send me the sports uh, scores ahead of time. That way I'll know what to put in terms of the bats like Biff does in Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah, the sports almanac. Yeah, you yeah, can yeah. Make all the Do you, <laughs> so, yeah, if you're an hour ahead of me, you know the sports the sports uh, scores. Anyway, welcome everybody. As you guys know, uh, we have uh, for a few weeks planned this stream with Tim Gordon. And no, it is not a debate. Tonight's stream is going to be me interviewing Tim as a uh, specialist, as a person who uh, I would defer to. I don't know <clears throat> at any kind of graduate level the uh, specificity of all of the medieval uh, scholastic theology. And Tim is a specialist in uh, Aristo scholastic uh, philosophy and theology. So, Tim, I'll let you introduce, you know, what your what your specialty is, what your topics are tonight. We're going to talk about the five Deserata, the the offerings of the medieval philosophers as they uh, solve some of the issues that are out there. But first, why don't you tell us about your uh, your academic background and all that, and what your if you want to, what you're studying and what your uh, your degree is going to be. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, and thanks for having me on this show. Guys like you and I that do what we do are out here saying on any given night things a uh, thousand times more um, full of gravity and therefore technically more frightening to say than what folks around our country are bothering to say to each other at the water cooler. They're afraid to say something a, a, a thousand as heavy since you brought up Michael J. Fox and Biv, and uh, I don't know about you, but I've, you know, alienated more people in this lifetime already, privately, publicly, than I than I care for. So I, I appreciated you you reaching out. It's a cool thing to do. Yeah, well, I thought that the what you handled the Creed jokes pretty well. So I thought actually when you said <laughs> when you said that you had been getting Creed jokes since high school, I was like, all right, we'll, we'll be able to get along now. So that's good, bro. I my my older brother not the not the one you're debating that's my younger brother and i once fought and this was me being the cooler head prevailing being the one called creed once fought a couple of bouncers in downtown huntington beach because he <laughs> troubled to call me creed and i'm like this, this is old hat greg uh -oh. what, are you, what are you doing man losing your head my, my brother's a phd in science and he's he's going off hack cock so and and that was you know five years old at least but we took it personally in the day because we were we were metal guys you were a metal so, dude uh, yeah that makes sense <laughs> yeah yeah i mean if you're a metal dude and you're getting called creed i mean that's like that's below the belt dude right it's devastating it's devastating yeah anyway so my my uh my background is in philosophy and i, I did an undergrad degree at a science school so it's a double degree in 
history lit and all, all the philosophy came there. Then I did a master's degree, which was mostly continental stuff at Loyola Marymount when I moved back to LA. I'm, a, I'm an Angelino. I was born in Los Angeles, but spent a lot of time from middle school through undergrad in, in uh, the DFW area. And when I graduated undergrad, got back out to California and got married and did, I think, a mostly useless continental philosophy undergrad at Loyola. And then, of course, I was connecting in my first few years as a married working guy teaching, reconnecting with the truths of the peripatetic Aristotle and, and through Aristotle, St. Thomas, because I was really an agnostic, like so many guys reared in the 80s and 90s. And so I decided, you know, I, I want to do a doctorate and I wanted to do it in Aristotomism. And I went to a pontifical university, the oldest Jesuit school in the world, the Greg in Rome, and was studying Aristotle and St. Thomas, got a degree no one recognizes. I, I debated Josh Hammer last, last month. And I also have a law degree and they didn't know what the hell it was. It's a PHL. It's all a licentiate degree. And I was going to, does go this give you, does this mean you get a degree, you get a degree in being licentious, like you get free reign to <laughs> like a licentious, uh, like James Bond has a license to kill. You have a licentious degree to do whatever the heck you want. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah freedom, not order oriented at the good. I have a degree to, to exercise freedom, not oriented at thinking. Uh, we love bad yeah. jokes here. So go ahead. Yeah, it's Sunday night, so it's dad joke time. What, what's up, people? Uh, and after, after the PHL, my degree in being licentious, which is a very old degree, even if secular folk like Josh Hammer don't recognize it, I was going to go on to do the PhD. My first daughter was born to my wife out there, my wife and I out there on uh, uh, Tiberina Island in the middle of the Tiber, uh, with, with surprising, shocking health issues a month early. And so we had to, we had to go home. We went home in a, in a terror once she was born a few months afterwards. So I'd gotten into the program and tabled what I was doing. I'm now working on a PhD at a program. I don't, I don't say where it is, but it's a St. Thomas specialty program uh, here in the States. And I, I, got a, I got a JD in between. But really, Aristotle and St. Thomas are, I know they're talked about a lot. And their names get dropped a lot, but folks rarely get into the specifics of what what makes Aristotelianism so important to just the the basic ability to think. So I, I I'll, I'll I'll talk about some of that tonight in five or six ways. Yeah, that's perfect. <clears throat> and I want to say too for the audience, so some people might be surprised at this stream, but you heard it from Tim himself. He was at a Jesuit university, so we know he's Illuminate confirmed. I'm just joking, because a lot of people are gonna be like, he was at a, oh, oh. Like, as if everyone that goes to a university is then under a Jesuit mind control operative and they all become Illuminate. It's just really idiotic, but we, we deal with these kinds of stupid critiques. No, I'm joking, uh, but to be serious, um, you know, a lot of people uh, in my audience might think, well, you've done so many critiques of this kind of stuff and, and uh, why would you do this kind of a stream? Well, we wanna uh, be clear that for the Orthodox Church, for people on our side, there's a lot of influence of Aristotle. And people may not know that, but uh, St. John of Damascus, very influenced by Aristotle. In fact, he's a <clears throat> pretty significant turn ideologically towards Aristotle that didn't really exist in, say, the Cappadocians, who were much more influenced by, by uh, in <clears throat> the uh, St. Gregory Palamas. People don't know that when he wrote the Apodictic Treatise, Apodictic is the Aristotelian logic. So he was trained in Aristotelian logic. Everybody in Byzantium would have been trained in Aristotelian logic. And so that kind of helps, I think, to uh, smooth the 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 way here to understand that like my approach is not this uh, totally reactionary thing where, oh, everything in uh, scholasticism is wrong. The last thing I'll say on this, and then I'll hand it back over to you is, you know, one, one, pe one area I think people get confused is that they hear a critique of a lot of the notions of self-evidence or something like that. And that's not because I don't believe in the principles of, you know, act and potency, or I don't believe in the principles of uh, cause, uh, you know, causation, or I don't believe in telos, or I don't, it's not that I don't believe in those things. That's just, just a question of how we go about justifying them. But when it comes to the principles themselves, 
Tim and I, I think we would be completely in agreement. I believe in most of the basic ideas that you're going to find in, uh, you know, Aristotle. And one example of, of how we know this is that if you read John Damascus's book, Fount of Knowledge, it's a little book that's an, a, a, an introductory book to the, the full Catholic University volume of John Damascus's works. All of Fount of Knowledge is basically just appropriating Aristotelian philosophy and terms. And he just explains what they mean in the Orthodox Church. That's it. So, Or, or for the East, I should say, because, of course, Tim would, would also share uh, St. John Damascus as a saint as well in, in his communion. So let's maybe get into some of the things that you think are uh, really important that solves these issues. Because uh, let me give you one example. Like... <clears throat> Um, I don't know what your what your view of Phaser is, but you know Phaser is one of the uh, Thomas that I've kind of read quite a bit of, and and not just Phaser, but I read Whiffle and other people too. But you know Phaser has a book about introduction to scholastic metaphysics, and in that yeah. book, <clears throat> he does a lot of things that present solutions to like modern scientism dilemmas, right, or or modern postmodern philosophical dilemmas, and how a lot of what the scholastics were talking about is actually a solution to that. Um, and scientism, although it doesn't realize it, is operating on a false philosophy. And all of this stuff was already kind of there in these ancient and medieval guys. And then I'll hand that over to you. Have you uh, had a look at Aristotle's Revenge? That's his, I think, second that, is, Yeah, so my buddy Lewis uh, just told me to get that one. And um, I, one. yeah, and, and he's there's one of the ones that he talks about. Uh, what's that other one that he's got? The Yellow Book. I can't see it, but. The one that's about Darwin and evolution and all that, where he's critiquing scientism in that too. But oh, no, I haven't. Superstition. That's yeah. it. Yeah, I haven't gotten to the other one yet. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. And I, I, I know Ed uh, from from being out there in LA. My my friend Chris taught his kids, and I've uh, met with Ed a few times. He's a really jolly guy. What I thought I'd do tonight is just in the interest of of good old fashioned uh, uh, Jesbian style ecumenism really talk about Plato qua Aristotle, because there is, uh, I mean, this is, this is, I think, arguable stuff, but with the point of view, I'm going to uh, attempt to express fully is the idea that the Neoplatonists are those who have really, in, in my view, in the, in the Catholic view, exaggerated the connection between Plato and Aristotle and really uh, underrepresented the points of departure between Plato and Aristotle. So um, if did you want me to start with the, the, the five points? Well, that, I mean, that's, that's interesting because uh, the Neoplatonists definitely are stressing the, they want to do a synthesis, right? So, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this. My understanding is that, that Aristotle thought I'm going to do the better synthesis of what the pre-Socratics and Plato had. So you've got Plato, you got pre-Socratics, Aristotle says, I'm going to do the synthesis. And then, the Neoplatonists were like, no, no, we're going to synthesize Plato and Aristotle. We're going to be the real true synthesis. So they had a sort of a vested interest in sort of in, in you know reconciling these two things. So um, yeah, feel free to launch in however you want to on that. Uh, that's that's an interesting take. So you you're, you think that this is really something that they stress that isn't justified because the the departure between them is significant enough that um, it's pretty much what would you say like definitive a definitive departure. Absolutely. As old Plato would say, and I think it's the statesman, sophist or statesman, you can't explicate false logoi, right? You can't, you can't ration, you can't show your work on a math problem you got wrong. And um, Plato simply struggles with some basic philosophical problems. And I, I'm, I'm not, by the way, I'm not trained in any theology. It's I'm, I'm purely trained in philosophy and then constitutional law. Uh, so Plato really never did and and could not uh explain the inter formal interaction with the material yeah i and agree with is, that totally agree yeah, with that. Yeah. such a basic problem like i mean you look at i i presented this because i don't i don't know exactly uh what your but this is how i would present it to my audience i don't know what your audience's level of familiarity with plato or aristotle are but I mean, you look at Raphael's painting School of Athens, and of course Aristotle's pointing up because the the forms the most intelligible iteration of all the material copies of all the things which exist down here below. The forms exist in what he called the noetic heaven. And they were really true. He 
intuits, insinuates, and um, it, it, at best he expresses without justifying that there's a causal interaction, but he can't ever say what it is, you know? And, and so at the most basic level, I know people in your audience probably have heard of this, but Aristotle is a hylomorphist, meaning form is in matter, which is why in School of Athens, Aristotle's holding his hand down. This is this is basic stuff, and, and um, we'll get a little more specific from here, but hylomorphism and specifically Aristotle's doing this, saying form is in matter, you know, matters the basically what, what St. Thomas will call the principle of individuation. At other times, St. Thomas will call matter this stuff, the, the principle of uh, uh of uh called the principle of individuation which is how formal things are here below or are, right uh, named one from another and potency it's also called the principle of potency so basically if there's forms up above and there's matter down here how do we ever see interaction aristotle ans answers that um well for causeness all things have uh, four causes and what plato called matter is just a material cause what plato called form is just the formal cause the principle of intelligibility which is their first act and then there's also two extra causes the final cause the telos which you mentioned in your opening their their reason for being which perpetually animates them and then uh of course uh, efficient causes which is more associable with with scientism and you know doing work uh, you know, one one lever being pulled or something being pushed, doing doing physics work. Um, so it's it's interesting that Plato simply can't solve this problem. He posits the forms. This was the old pre-Socratic problem of how does change happen at all, and it has something to do with this interaction between these two completely divorced realms. For Plato, he posits it, and to that extent. That Aristotle accepts, well, there's sort of two realms, the formal and the material. I guess Aristotle's a, a Platonist, but to the extent that Aristotle says, no, 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 form is in matter. I mean, not spatially, but as it were, it's it's in matter, informing it, where literally you look at, it's a bad example because it's an artifact, it's a man-made thing, it's not a natural kind, but you look at a chair, that that looks as if it supports, you know, a human figure. It's about the right structure. It's made of the right stuff to support a human frame. That's what that's what all things are. The, so the principle of right. intelligibility inheres because matter is caused by form. Now, St. Saint, Saint Thomas will say form a da essay, meaning that form gives existence to the thing. And uh, yeah, but but here, metaphysically, Thomas is an Aristotelian, right? Plato. Plato really can't solve this problem. He half solves it, but it remains apparatic. The Greeks would say, well, still, even with Plato's own account, how does how does matter and form uh, allegedly interact? And, and Aristotle solves this. You don't hear this said often enough when historians of philosophy talk. Like, Plato's cool. I think Alfred North Whitehead said all of philosophy is a footnote to Plato, but Aristotle really you know yeah I think we would definitely agree with this this is a, a like you said a classic critique I was I re recently reread um Coppelson's chapter on <clears throat> Plato and and even Coppelson had noted you know back when he wrote that that this is really a fundamental problem that uh Plato's not going to be able to reconcile because of the dialectical nature of these two 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 things right matter is in this constant state of flux realm of the forms is opposite of that in fact it seems to be cast out as opposite of that although there is one curious area where uh cobbleson does note that play and i think it's just because plato is inconsistent plato t does talk about metexis or participation so on the one hand he's got this idea that the forms are the self-subsisting causes of things in this world both uh, particulars and universals uh mm -hmm. but how do we or excuse me the essence is how how <laughs> Um, in terms of, uh, the way those two realms are cashed out, like they're cashed out as opposites. And so th how is there going to be a participation in the thing up there, which is opposite of th the things down here? 
it's not really answered. And he resorts to weird things like, uh, well, maybe uh, in your preexistent life, you remembered it from the realm of the forms and right. uh, <laughs> you're remembering it now in this life. So all of that, I think, is really untenable. But um, do, what are you I'm not, I'm not putting you on the spot. Honest question. Um, what do you think of that? Because Coppelson does talk about it. What do you think about that notion of participation in higher uh, forms? And do you think that's good enough? Uh, as a kind of rescue, or does it just really not rescue things on in part, on the uh, Plato's part? It it now it's really interesting. The reason that you have all these pictures of Saint Thomas with Aristotle and and Plato is because this idea of participation will cash out metaphysically when you get to Arist I mean, Aristotle gave Western philosophy so many so many. Uh, it bequeathed to Western philosophy so much, even before you you talk about Christian theology uh even you know even just from the pure philosopher's perspective if you know one other thing that aristotle gave the world is this halfway point between equivocity and univocity when we're talking about predication you know does a name is, it, is it the name of a thing refer to the essence or the quiddity uh strictly does it refer to something totally other well, Aristotle gives this notion of prosen equivocity, which in, in Thomas's philosophy will become analogia. You know, I, I know, I know, you know, all this. Yeah, today, we agree with that. Trying yeah. to break it. Up. Yeah. But so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm keeping it pretty basic here. I, I don't I'm not really expecting any of this to present a challenge because this is just bequeathments. By yeah, that's cool. I mean, this is great for this audience. Yeah. So keep you know, do, do it however yeah. you want. Yeah. And I, I think this is vastly underrepresented how how far short. Plato comes from solving this problem. So yes, participation will pop back up and it is uh, Plato's main uh, donation to the Christian tradition, but it doesn't pop up under predication, uh, formal causation. It, it can't pop back up. You know, that was the first point where uh, Plato's philosophy is really impoverished and not just as epistemology, but, but ontologically. Um, and then, of course, yeah, so so the problem of the universals, you mentioned it. This is a problem Plato posits and admits he can't solve, that Aristotle comes along and solves. He can't even say quite how uh, the how a, you can expl express the difference between a red jacket and the existence, the ontological value of red existing in the world. He had no account that was really meaningful of accidents in the world it takes aristotle to solve this problem so plato can say yes i know red is a thing same as i i think i plato figured out that the forms are a thing but how is red predicated of santa's suit uh, as accident to substance uh, you mentioned the term uh subsistent a self-subsistent thing this is what's a substance Arist aristotle will adduce this uh, uh you know, 10 categories of existence. The first is substance and the rest of the nine categories are accidents that are predicated of substance. And this single-handedly, relatively elegant, but relatively simple, solves Plato's problems of universals. How are, how are accidents pertinent to substances? Plato knows that a red exists, but he can't say how it exists. And it's, it's certainly not subsistent. Um, Aristotle with the 10 categories of existence all of a sudden gives the world, not just people, not just Christians, not even just theists, but all the world, Coppelstein included, a, a vocabulary, a lexicon for uh, describing the interrelation of substance and accidents. And, and people just don't, I don't know if it's a kind of political correctness out of deference to Plato, but people just don't say this often enough that Plato literally couldn't even say what the difference between red and a red is. Uh, yeah. So substance is the first category of existence plus the nine accidental categories which follow. Um, this explicates how having an essence, it, it, this will, we'll, we'll talk later about the six modes of composition that, that St. Thomas will be real specific about. How, having an essence puts a thing into existence and puts it into one of the 10 categories. You don't get any of this do you when you read plato you get no sense of um 
a technical procedural ontology and that's that's really what, what we moderns crave when we look back and it's always what folks who are skeptical about the ancients are happily humbly surprised to find in aristotle but when you read plato it, it feels more like what you expected to read in an ancient i think i'm sad to say yeah well uh, so i just did a long podcast with uh, a, a person from the uh intelligence world uh stephen coughlin <clears throat> and he in recent years uh has gotten really interested in plato and Aristotle and uh, he he's a Catholic uh, a thinker and he I think he would pretty much agree with most of what you're arguing here <clears throat> and one thing that we we pointed out and got into in this uh, podcast that we just did but it'll be out in a few get a few days for those in the audience uh, was that Plato really seems to be a uh, mystical theological thinker um, yeah. and and the there's multiple places i didn't even realize because i read a lot of the dialogues and and uh republic and all that several times through but there's areas i hadn't read like i didn't notice it in the symposium there's a section where he talks about that the mysteries that he had gotten from uh solon which is this is mentioned at the beginning of the timaeus but in the symposium it's it's a separate statement that he's actually teaching the the mysteries of thoth he explicitly says this, uh, and that's the actual body of teachings. And so <clears throat> I say that because I think the Neoplatonists, and I was just going into this because I'm teaching a class uh, to some people on uh, history of Western philosophy, and I just finished a bunch of reading of you know, Neoplatonic stuff. And one thing I noticed was that they're actually correct, I think, in saying, no, you guys have missed it. Plato is a mystical, theological, initiatory teacher. It's an initiation it's yeah. not a, a, a method of understanding the world and understanding being and so forth that anyone can sort of access. This is some elite kind of thing that only the in, in initiated elite have access to. So um, that might be one, you know, I, I, and I don't know that Aristotle uh, had any notion of that. Certainly there's kind of, there's the celestial spheres and there's the, the, the heavens kind of, you know, and turning and all this kind of stuff, which is kind of mystical and theological, but um, would you agree that the that Aristotle is a departure from this heavily uh, mystical initiatory approach? Absolutely. I mean, he's the father of logic. He's the father of taxonomy in many ways, of father of biology, whether or not he got it right. But he's really he's more of a scientist, of, right? Yeah, yeah. But he's also a metaphysician. I mean, right. that's the, that's well, the for thing. him, science is metaphysics, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. First, first, first philosophy first philosophy is metaphysics but you read aristotle's i mean i don't know if you come across this man but it's funny a lot of catholics think when i say metaphysics i'm talking theology i'm like oh i i, I really have no training in theology i'm i'm going to do a dissertation on you know metaphysics to mystic metaphysics and this is the furthest thing in many ways it's the furthest science from theology i mean it is it is doing what really is the physics of Aristotle. That's what metaphysics is. What what's really there? You know, when you're talking about the whole uh, um, substantial composite and and talk about this thing in in ter qua all six of its modes of composition. What really is this rock? What really is this uh, abstract idea? What really is an angel? What really is a man? So it's it's not theology and and a lot of catholics when i say metaphysics they they really do go straight to theology interesting i'm I, that that one i'm kind of mystified by because from my perspective like i don't uh, and i'm not taking i'm not trying to debate with you i'm just uh, can you go more into that is that because of the uh notion of these being first principles like metaphysics is sort of first science first philosophy first principles and theology is kind of like what you would do separate from that, right? I mean, my understanding of Aquinas is that he has like a roughly kind of a two-tiered thing. Like you do your natural philosophy, your natural theology first. And then when you learn those principles, like revealed theology would kind of be like sit, sitting on top of that. And there's, there's overlap, sure. It's two circles with overlap. But sure. the, the, but the nature grace scheme, right, that the revelation builds upon the principles of nature. Is that why you, you're saying that's the case? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I mean, of course, there's overlap. I'm just saying m most Catholics think these terms are synonymous, metaphysics and theology. I mean, theology is, properly speaking, the study of, of God, and it sits atop, like you said. But metaphysics is really just you know, reading the body of the physics and then keep going. I mean, for, for Aristotle, a lot of 
your audience probably knows that the Nicomachean Ethics, one of his arguably his most important book of, of practical philosophy, was supposed to just be an introduction to the politics. He, he thought the politics was tremendously important, uh, Aristotle did. And he considered the Nicomachean Ethics explicitly, he says this in three places, just an introduction to it. So a lot of times, yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to write a hagiography here for Aristotle. Plenty of people have done that, but he's so important that he doesn't even, he's doing so many important things at once, so many important corrections of Plato, I might add, that I, I he mistakes himself, and at other times, subsequent thinkers have mistaken the prioritization of what his most important texts are. All, all I'm saying about metaphysics is it's actually closer to physics than theology, though obviously it's the kind of tightrope walked between the two but um i see what you're saying okay yeah, yeah and, just, and that makes sense i guess with aristotle because he's you know like we said he's a turn towards empirical data toward not an empiricist but it turns toward empirical data of investigation you know he's going and looking at the animals walking around he's not sitting back and pondering his orb like plato right, right. so he's, he's going out and learning things and and trying to do investigation proto science basically i guess you could say in the, in the modern notion of quote science but Right. Um, so that's why metaphysics would be more like the study of actually what's going on in physics proper, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah, what's really real in these substantial composites? Like, I mean, this is this Platonic term. What's what's the really real when you study nature? That's that's you know, phusis is nature for the Greeks, and uh, what's really behind the physics? You get all these wonderful metaphysical com uh, concepts introduced in the third, fourth, fifth books of the physics, but you really get the proper treatment in, in the metaphysics. And uh, yeah, so I mean, so Plato, let's just, just for a quick review, the first two things I said, Plato can't explain the interaction between form and matter. He knows it's there, but he just throws up his hands, more or less. He, he, he knows it's there and, and can't say what it is. Aristotle solves this. Secondly, the problem of the universals, this is most basic. Plato knows that red is not a red, but but according to the epistemology metaphysics that he gives us, he because he he can't account for substance accident interaction, it takes Plato to do that. He can't solve the problem of the universal. In other words, Plato knew folks out there that a cow uh, could be predicated of uh, all of these genera at once, like bovary and mammal and four-legged creature but because he didn't have a sense of of how to solve the problem of the universals or prosen equivocity he didn't know how does a cow pertain to all these categories at once and that this brings us to the third uh problem with plato comes up in both the ethics and the metaphysics is plato believed in univocal predication and there's no univocal predication how the hell does that work like plato thinks being and the good, two of the transcendentals, are genera. I think he thought all of the transcendentals are genera. And there's a classic problem with this. Aristotle shows both how and why being and the good can't be genera, specifically because if they are, if the, let's, let's talk about the ethics for a minute, it, where Aristotle keeps repeating this point. I love my friend Plato, but I love the truth more. Plato was searching for a unity of the virtues, which would be nifty, you know, to, to get one sort of, uh, you know, one ring that brings all the other rings, one super virtue that gets you all the other virtues. But it's it's not like that. Getting the uh, moral virtues, which Aristotle talks about in, starting in book two through three, four, five, then he gets to the intellectual virtue in book six of the ethics. You get them one by one. So it's more like muscle groups when you're working out. Dudes, if you're working out your upper body and that's all you work out, you're going to look like one of these uh, cartoon guys that doesn't work on his legs. There's no super virtue. And that's exactly how it works. But that all comes from the proposition that there is no univocal predication uh, of, of good. If good is a being term, then there would be no way that it could be predicated across all the other categories. In other words, yeah. individual moral virtues, courage, uh, 
I don't know, pick pick a boring one. Magnificence, that's one of the really boring ones. If you're a governor, you should have a big house or something. That's actually a virtue. These are specific approaches to the good, to eudaimonia, but they're not species of the genus, the good. That, that wouldn't work out. The predicles, predicables don't work that way. And um, in the ethics, each of the moral virtues participate in the good. So you're bringing in that one concept of Plato, but not in the way he says. They're not species of it. Each of the virtues must be gotten one by one like muscle groups. And this becomes an even more important principle with more gravity when you get into Aristotle's metaphysics and then Thomas's uh, commentary on the metaphysics. So, yeah, like in terms of the predicating of good, one thing that's weird is that in Plato, on the one hand, there seems to be this, uh, there's a hierarchy to this, whereas, you know, and <clears throat> I think the, the Neoplatonists, again, are trying to resolve this problem, too, because the monad uh, is described both as aperon, as the boundless, but also as the one and the good. And then there's this diminished status of the second principle of intellect or nous, it's like it's like a reflection of that highest one and it's also the good and then uh the third principle of world soul or whatever uh it's also the good but it's in like diminished status and it's a chain of being but how can we have a chain of being how can we how can we predicate uh being uh common to something that is described in terms of the monad in plato as nothing like the being uh, that descends from that being because aperon, boundless, which comes from the pre-Socratics, is impossible to have any predicates. So how are we going to say that the one is the good, the beautiful, the just, etc., if it's beyond all predicates? And yeah, I know we could say, oh, well, it's apophatic and all this kind of stuff. But there's no possibility of, of po uh, positive predication or cataphatic pred predication if we've already said that the one is uh, beyond all predicates. Um, and you get this in Dionysius because Dionysius in the divine names says a lot of the same types of things, uh, which he echoes a lot of the Neoplatonic stuff. But yeah. um, in my view, for us as Orthodox, this is precisely where the energies come in. So for us, the predicate, uh, when we do the positive predicates, that's to the different inner Gaia. It's not to uh, the monad or to the operon or the, what the pre-Socratics and, and these people are calling operon, we, we would say that applies to the essence, which is not you can't predicate of that and so this is one of the areas where there's a departure between orthodox and aquinas for example like if you read saint gennadius who's orthodox he has a really uh positive statements about the uh the summa and he says you know we can agree with a lot of what's in the summa and that's you know saint gennadius could be kind of the example figure <laughs> the patron saint for the orthodox of tonight's discussion because he says the one area where we couldn't agree with Aquinas would be on that uh, notion of the inner Gaia. But I don't want to go into that. I'll just go back to, uh, unless you want to comment on that, feel free. But um, so we had to, to recap. Um, and we I would agree with each of these problems so far that uh, Tim has laid out. The uh, university of predication in Plato. Um, the uh, interaction between form and matter. Problem of universals. So that's three. Was there What was, what was the fourth? Was there a fourth one you've gotten to yet or not yet? Well, no, no. So the fourth, fourth is, uh, and you can, you know, you feel free to comment on all that stuff I said if you take issue with any of that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually curious. I'm curious what you're gonna say with regard to Plato's inability to express change meaningfully, which is that was the next point. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. So uh, one thing that I think Aristotle is so great about, and this is precisely where Saint Maximus comes into the picture. Because Maximus pulls from Neoplatonists, from Plato, and Aristotle. And it's precisely because Maximus, in, especially in the Ambigua, wants to answer some of the problems that Origen has raised. Because Origen has thrown up all this dust and this confusion, and it affected a couple of the Cappadocians, including Gregory of Nyssa. So in the Ambigua, St. Maximus says, we're going to have to deal with this dialectic of stasis and change, being and becoming. And this goes back to, to Plato, right? Because Plato doesn't have an account for change. And one of the great insights that Aristotle does bring to the table where Maximus and John of Damascus say, no, 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 Aristotle has this right because his philosophy gives an account for change. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, 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 the interesting thing is for Plato, 
there's zero account for meaningful change. I mean, what happened in Athens, starting with Socrates, is the Athenian Enlightenment or whatever, they're responding to a bunch of pre-Socratic thinkers that are attempting to account for change. Like right. attempt, the attempt to account for change just as a history of philosophy matter for your for your audience is the name of philosophy. I mean, this is this is ultimately the archaeology of philosophy. They were just trying to account for is change illusory? Or on the one hand, on the you know, Parmenidean hand, where there's this pre-Socratic philosopher called Parmenides who said change is illusory, change is impossible. Here's why. Here's some mathematical and geometrical principles which prove which prove he had this disciple called uh, Mino who who proved that change was impossible. Achilles and the hair, a bunch of different iterations of Achilles and the hair, which proved that any change is really impossible. All of the, yeah, you had the arrow example, right? The paradox yeah, the, of the arrow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all of them are are, are funny. Uh, he had like one good idea. It was Achilles and the hair, and then the arrow was just you know chewed meat rehashing of that. And it, they're compelling. The compelling ideas, I think, um, you know, having l the concept of limits and calculus would have pretty much dispelled the, the 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 what was aphoretic in Achilles and the hair. But the point was, the Parmenideans could prove that all change was illusory and that all being was frozen. It was one. There was no multifariousness. There there wasn't the problem of the one and the many for them. Any any uh, uh, appearance of pluralism or change was just that an illusory appearance of it and then you have the opposite guys the heracliteans who said that all of the world was nothing but change and there was fire no atoms movie. you got a lot of fire atoms going on tonight right right so uh, uh so th this is where socrates plato aristotle emerge this is literally where they emerge they say okay here's an account for change and like you said, Jay, what Plato offers is the uh, uh, kind of ontologically dual conception of the world. There's form up there. Like if you go look at um, Raphael's painting and there's matter down here and they're utterly divorced. Technically, I guess Plato's giving us an account for how accidental, meaningless change occurs, right? Decay, decadence. The way that that um, physical kind, natural kinds, bodies break down, okay, but that's not meaningful formal change. So, Arist so Plato can't give an account for formal change, good good things that happen or meaningful things that happen, um, things that have a formal cause, and and Aristotle gives that. So the so Aristotle gives a second way for us to think about actualized potency, which is. Uh, a change which is actualized potency uh phaser did a really 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 impressive job of explaining this in about two minutes when he went on ben shapiro's show the first time he was just saying to to a wholly unphilosophical audience saying changes actualized potencies i can move my hand from here to here because it's there's a there's a potency to do so and now I just actualize it. And I can move it from here to here because there's a potency to move my hand from here to here. I just actualize the potency. That's that's what change is. That's what movement is. We have basically two of Thomas's five arguments for God that are essentially different iterations of the idea of change movement. And um, and so all of a sudden now, Aristotle can account for change, not by talking about form and matter, that's half of the equation, and I guess you can uh, account for material accidental change that way, like we said before. But now you can account for formal change that's meaningful, intelligible, not not uh, reducible to accidents. You know, what's an accident? You, if you don't, if you lack the philosophical lexicon the way my five year old does, he doesn't know. I, I skinned my knee. Well, that that action has no formal cause. It's not intelligible. Um. Okay, so then then you get into Aristotle really setting the table for several of Thomas's five ways. You know, God is an unmoved mover, immutability, and Aristotle's not really trying to be a theologian here. It's just uh, 
a professor of mine in my PhD program studied under Shields, who's kind of the living demigod of Aristotle. And this guy, this guy was known to say basically Aristotle's almost like the voice of the Holy Spirit before Jesus, like setting the table because he's giving us on strictly natural grounds the way to account for change in ways that will be relevant to God. Uh, predication, someone had to solve that problem. The universals, the one and the many, accidents and substance, and of course, uh, uh, cause, cause itself. And these are uh, several of these are what we call these first four uh, problems with Plato that Aristotle solved. Several of these are logical axioms or first principle. I was impressed when uh, you did that show with uh, uh, my friend Joe and uh, Mario, Christian Mario, and, and you were talking about retorsion, one of the niftiest principles out there. Retorsion is the idea. This is also my fifth trick of Aristotle's that I thought I'd uh, produce for everyone here tonight. How well we know these first principles exist: the principle of the excluded middle, principle of non-contradiction, the principle of causation. Uh, even you could even apply this to the first principle of practical reason: do the good, avoid evil. But because they're like the monad, they're like the building block of arguments. How do we prove that? How do we justify these first principles if they're actually axioms? There's nothing to build the argument from. And Aristotle does it not with a, a, a proped or quid demonstration, which is how he likes to prove everything, because he's such a non-mystical thinker. He likes to prove everything logically. But with something that I don't know if technically this counts for Aristotle's, uh, what he called a quia demonstration, but it's something very like a quia demonstration in uh Gamma books three and four of the metaphysics. He, he, yeah, does he, he does the a, a torsion argument against the sophists, right? Is it before yes. or three or four? I always always get it mixed yeah. up. Yeah, I, I get it mixed up too. But it's 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 the niftiest shit you're ever gonna see because it, you could use this again if you're debating, uh, uh, you know, any of the the four horsemen type atheists. You can just destroy them with retorsion type arguments, and a lot of a lot of Christian Aristotelians, a lot of Catholic Aristotelians who don't study the metaphysics don't even know it exists. So I was, I was impressed that you, you pulled this. Well, out. yeah, we make a big what point over it? here uh, on, on our side uh, of the apologetics against the atheists and, and these people to use the transcendental argument for God, which is a form of what you're talking about, right? So it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of a reductio move where you can reduce uh, the opponent's position to absurdity. So uh, anyway, yeah, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, any attempt, any attempt to deny a first principle, which by debt by its definition can't be proven, proped or quid, uh, will wind up becoming a performative contradiction. So, employing the principle you seek to deny, right? If if you if if you try to deny, uh, there's a I think a Jesuit. <laughs> I don't like the Jesuits. I, I'm a known critic of the Jesuits, but uh, there's a good one called Joseph Marshall. And he really no, that's just because you're, you're just an Illuminati a program by the Jesuits. You're, so you're just saying that to give everybody the impression that you're against Jesuits. But uh, you're on to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, this guy Joseph Marischal po repopularized retorsion in the early 20th century, and he was like, "This is nifty. What what if someone alleges against you uh, there are no assertions? Well, he had to assert that there are no assertions. So yeah, this." It's, this is in, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to cut you off. I just get really sort of spurgy and excited when this comes up. Um, if you read The uh, Fount of Knowledge, the book that I referenced, uh, no, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the audience. So if you guys remember, we've covered Fount of Knowledge. Uh, I, did, I did a talk to that, I think, five years ago. If you want to search the channel, you can find the discussion where we went through the totality of, uh, found, it's not actually that long. It's about 60, 70 pages, something like that, maybe 100 pages. But the very first page has St. John Damascus using this argument. He says, and it's I think he's it's because he's pulling from Aristotle's metaphysics. He says, uh, what would you say to someone who said uh, there is no philosophy? And St. John Damascus says, well, you would be making a philosophical statement and you would be presupposing logic to argue against logic, and that would be self-refuting. And so, I think again, you know, Tim and I would totally agree with all that. I would be, I'd be totally on the same page. The one uh, area where I would take issue, and I'm not trying to start a debate, but um, it's because my, my good friend, uh, Father Deacon Dr. Ananias, he did a paper on this, and he also has a buddy that uh, he sent me his buddy's paper, uh, Russ Mannion, who's a philosopher, I think, in California. And they both have really good arguments, I think, that 
while it's true that retorsion is a good, uh, it, it's a step in the right direction, it still isn't enough because it doesn't, and there's certain objections that people could make that it doesn't get us to the status of justification. So we don't have to go into that tonight. Maybe we could do a whole separate, yeah. we could do a separate talk on like justification and the the response. So I think it, it's right. It's the right step, but it doesn't get to, okay, but th- there's objections that people can make to that, that need, need us to make a more of a positive case rather than just the negative uh, of the, of the uh, you know, reductio or whatever. Yeah, it's not, it, certainly. It's not a demonstration through a proper cause, uh, which is to say, you uh, you don't see the conclusion from the term's essence. Uh, um, I don't know how you ever could otherwise hold well, up. Well, this is where paradigmatic arguments come into play. So like, and, and sure. like when sure. you said, for example, uh, there was one phrase that, because I'm taking notes on what you say, not to critique you or trick you, just understanding where you're coming from. You said strictly natural grounds, and it's it's not a trick. It's an honest question, not, not a trick question. I'm just, I'm I don't. <clears throat> what do you, when you say on strictly natural grounds? I think when you were talking about the principles of basic metaphysics being basically higher level physics, science proper, um, and Aristotle gives us the the basis for doing these things on strictly natural grounds. What what do you mean by strictly natural grounds? Like in other words, just not any appeal to divine revelation. Is that is that what that means for in your system? Yeah, I'm actually using a trying to justify a, a pl- the platonic goal, you know, the science of the really real. I've shown three or you know four or five ways that I think Plato just wasn't up to the task to to uh, Well, by by strictly natural grounds are you saying that like I can sh- I can show the problems in Plato are uh, uh superseded and and solved by Aristotle just on uh logical bases and nothing to do with theology is that is that what the sense in which strict, strictly natural grounds is used here yeah according to uh Fusis alone you know uh, Fusis combined with you know nature combined with natural reason we can we can solve what is uh the, the problems of metaphysics what is a tree really what is nature really where is man's place in in nature you can you can at least do a a rigorous science largely denied in in the 20th century by um a lot of the the founders of the analytic school like carnap and and those guys right you you can do a rigorous science i'm not saying it's a perfect science or it's perfectly complete or something like that but through you know nature alone nature and natural reason alone i'm just trying i'm trying to situate it gotcha as as a a deeper physics that's all metaphysics is you go through physics to do it so yeah. one other point too is uh that if, if we you know when if you want to continue having some of these discussions there's a really uh, <clears throat> really fascinating insight that maximus uh uses in the his idea of the logi which uh for those in the audience if you didn't see the interview that we did with dr tolison uh maybe two years ago tolison mm-hmm. wrote his phd on um, maximus mm-hmm. in the logi Mm-hmm. And there's a Chris Chris Tolson, yeah, uh, uh, Torstein. Oh, okay. Wait, I'm talking. I thought so, you were talking to Adam Baylor. Yeah. No, no, no. He's a, a Nordic, like a Swedish Nordic. Uh, he's an Orthodox. Uh, I don't know where he teaches, but okay. Yeah, we're we're talking different Tolsons. Yeah, different Sorry. Tolsons. But right. his uh, his thesis is on um, how Maximus uses the logi in a unique way to appropriate change. And uh, that's not the only thing he does. He does a, a bunch of it. In other words, he takes the uh, the Logi doctrine that we find in, for example, Plotinus and, and others. And this is the same thing as the divine ideas that, you know, the exemplars in the West, right? So Augustine, for example, has a very um, static doctrine uh, of the Logi, much like Plotinus. And <clears throat> so then the problem is that if the grounding of being in the, the Logi doctrine, according to, to the exemplars, for example, if, if uh, created order is grounded in the logi or the divine ideas, then there's a problem for accounting for change. Because if you locate the divine ideas in the divine essence, then they seem to be uh, not able to account for change either. Now, you can disagree with that if you want. That's fine. But I'm just saying this is Tolufson's, uh, uh account. And his, his thesis is about how Maximus really revolutionizes the, the uh, divine ideas to also account for change. So it doesn't mean that God himself undergoes change, but it means that God in the idea of the things has included 
the telos and the change over time. So in other words, every individual being's existence and their change and their ultimate telos is included in the divine idea. And that's something unique that Maximus borrows from Aristotle in a very uh, strange way. Nobody had really done this prior to St. Maximus in applying uh, change also to uh, being encapsulated in the divine ideas about the particulars of which the divine ideas kind of are the grounding. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I think so. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. So uh, what else? Oh, there was something I was going to say. So uh, you got the five. I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, feel free to. What, one of the things I had noted uh, as I was teaching this course was that, so for, if you're in the audience and you're uh, unclear about what it means when we talk about like uh, this notion of being and becoming uh, stasis and change, this is like, this is like in philosophy, this is identity over time. That's one uh, related question that relates to this. How do we predicate uh, of things meaningfully when it seems like things change? And so some philosophers said, well, there is no change. <laughs> and some philosophers said, no, uh, everything has changed, right? So you get these different um, attempts that uh, Tim was talking about in the pre-Socratics. And his point is that Plato uh, had no sufficient answer to identity over time and the notion of change. And Aristotle comes to the fore here to really help solve with this, with his account of act and potency, right? To this, which gives an account for this stuff, as I understand it, is what you're saying. And yeah, yeah. And so and Maximus appropriates that as well. So for us Orthodox people, we need to understand that uh, Aristotle is uh, very important to St. John Damascus and Maximus, as well as the, the rhetorician points that that uh, Tim was making. Yeah, think about like, biologists and doctors will you, you'll hear it said that every six or seven years, all of the cells in your body have been completely regenerated. So you're no longer at the molecular yeah, exactly. level of molecular right. biology. How are you the same? This is the notion of perdurance. How does the change? How does the thing stay the same essentially through a series of accidental change? What, what, what Jay's what you're talking about? How does it stay the same through a series of accidental changes that that might threaten to be that might seem to be essential changes. And this is literally what Aristotle single-handedly, Aristotle, you know, who Dante Alighieri calls the master of those who know, he gives us this, not only the lexicon, but he gives us, he brings the receipts and can show us how a thing stays what it essentially is through a series of changes such that, do I think where scholastic theology is really, or scholastic philosophy is really strong is that drawing out of Aristotle, who is doing a, a, a number of corrections to Plato in really fundamental ways, the, the four or five ways I've counted, and I guess retorsion doesn't really count, but at least four ways, Aristotle is picking apart major problems in Plato. Well, scholastic philosophy isn't so much showing, particularly St. Thomas, he's not showing problems with Aristotle, more just uh, he, he finishes the thought. And so St. Thomas in, um, he counts, I think in question three, first part of the Summa question three, he counts six modes of composition and he, you can apply them. You can, you know, you apply them to God when you talk about, you know, the kinds, kinds of things, uh, Catholics and Orthodox debate, we get into the issue of, uh, names of God, attributes of God, all that. It gets really interesting and it gets very inside baseball, but but also the six modes of composition are just ways that are there. They're inchoate, but they're there in Aristotle um, in terms of how act and potency interact. You could call act and potency sort of the biggie. This is the mode of composition, a creature, something that was created by God that's in the 10 categories of existence, something that's got aquidity, uh, something that's got an... an it's got existence, but it, it has an essence as well, and, and they're uh, distinct. Well, there are six modes of being composed, that means mixed, between act and potency. And they're not simple, the, the six are not simple re-expressions of the act-potency composition. They are, uh, in most cases, uh, outgrowths of act-potency composition, pros hen. So you've got... <laughs> Uh, matter and form, supposite nature, 
existence essence genus and specific difference or, or you know you might call it genus and species but the specific man is if our genus is animal we're the rational animal that's our species well our specific difference is being rational right um substance and accidents so it turns out that that these six modes of composition are uh, very, very, very important as I think Aristotle pretty much solved the problem of philosophy, Greek philosophy, you know, change, perdurance. I think it's pretty evident he did. So uh, these problems really do become important as, as in the sometime after Aristotle in the Christian era, they really started applying philosophical problems to theology and that it gets to be this, uh, um, it's hard to extricate philosophy and theology by the time you get to, you know, one, one millennium into the Christian era, you know? Yeah. One example and, that does back up what you're saying in terms of praxis and the history of the church, not so much the abstract stuff that we're talking about, but <clears throat> the, I mean, it's, it's not abstract, strictly speaking, it's very practical, but um, for those that don't know, a lot of times, for example, people say, oh, your theology, uh, then it could pl apply to your theology as Roman Catholic or even to Orthodox, uh, people make this criticism. Oh, you guys are Neoplatonic in a strict sense. Well, for those that don't know, in Byzantium, by the time of St. Justin, uh, Justinian, excuse me, the <clears throat> after the Fifth Council, Justinian uh, shut down the Platonic Academy. And after Justinian, you get at the Seventh Council, uh, what's produced out of that is a liturgical recitation known as the Triumph of Orthodoxy Synodicon. And this is still sung in most a lot of Orthodox churches, maybe not all of them. but And it includes certain anathemas. And one of the anathemas uh, in the Synodicon is an anathema against uh, Plato uh, and his philosophy. So, I mean, it's not wholesale everything about Plato, but it's the idea of Platonism and this is why the academy is shut down in Byzantium. It, every now and then it kind of makes a resurgence and then it gets put down again. And so what's fascinating is that Byzantine theology um, pretty much kind of goes in this direction in Byzantium. Like the tendency is in, in this direction. And anytime Neoplatonism pops up, it ends up spawning these weird heresies. Like you get uh, uh, iconoclasm. A lot of people don't know this. It actually comes out of Neoplatonism. Yep. Yeah. I did know that. Yeah, that's interesting. No, it's it's, uh, and I I think I see why I, I, for 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 a Catholic or an Orthodox, um, n it's Gnosticism, right? Yes, right. So Plotinus says that you the the material world, although it might not be inherently evil, it's still like the lowest level of being and something that you got to go get away from. And so when Origen uh, basically cloaked Neoplatonism in Christian garb. One of the uh, corollaries of that was the idea that now that Christ has been resurrected, he only exists in an intellectual way, as if he doesn't still have the body that he was resurrected in. And right. so the Seventh Council, in terms of uh, St. Theodore's theology and St. John Damascus, they completely reject this. They said, no, uh, we can't have... And, and iconoclasts were self-consciously motivated by originism. They were actually saying, no, we know that you know if, if we follow our good Neoplatonist uh, forebearers, Christ exists in an, in an intellectual mental world. Uh, no, he doesn't. He has a body, right? So that's the basis of the Seventh Council's rejection of iconoclasm because it was originistic. Hmm. That's good. That's interesting stuff. I didn't know Justinian shut down the academy. Yes, he's the first to do that because um, if you, well, presumably it's because he recognized at the Fifth Council that what was influencing the monophysite argumentation was uh, uh, in the mono what will become the monothelite and monoenergist uh, positions was Neoplatonism. So they would often cash out the uh, Pyrrhus, for example, he cashes out the relationship between the two wills and two energies as a, as a dialectic. Mm -hmm. And so the, the dialectic between the human will and Christ fighting the, the divine will in Christ has to be overcome by the divine will supplanting and replacing the human energy and will in Christ. So it's this overriding of the human will, <clears throat> and that's because there's a necessary tension between the one and the many, the human and the divine. And I, I, I'm, if you look at there, well, there's a lot more to this, but Cyril of Jerusalem is kind of the church father par excellence, uh, along with Justinian of the Fifth Council. And so they, you know, argued vehemently against this kind of a, a absurd uh, position. Yeah, that's good stuff. 
So, um, so uh, the, the the six modes of composition, and the reason I want to go to that is because uh, you know we we do find this, for example, in uh, John Damascus when he does the Fount of Knowledge. He he also mentions all this. Um, I think one thing that that confuses the uh, Orthodox Roman Catholic discussion on this topic, especially if we're talking about Orthodox talking to Thomas, is that, and, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Typically, wouldn't you guys say that these are really features of? Because we're going to step aside from from aerosol, right? In Aquinas, these are these are uh, the modes of composition that are necessarily uh, the the case for creatures. And so, in other words, there couldn't be any kind of actor potency in God because that would imply that He's imperfect and a creature, right? It would imply composition and parts and change, right? And so the argument. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and that's why you guys would say it doesn't make sense for you, you, you Orthodox to talk about God having first and second uh, actuality. Correct. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, if he's not, I, I, I know, uh, you know, change, change is the area where we would probably, probably begin disagreeing or could to put it another way, could have a very, very good conversation because yeah, for Thomas, when you fo there's a because of the interrelatedness of the six modes of composition, you can go in different directions when you talk about one. But because the big mode is act potency, it uh, we yeah we would apply that same characteristic of existence. You know, creatures that exist in the ten categories of existence. We would say, well, if um, if we can actualize a potency in God, then he's not immutable. So yeah, and, and and I'm only saying that because that that yeah. hopefully that helps clear up to everybody, especially even the Thomists and the and the Roman Catholics in the audience. That's why we always come to loggerheads when we're having this debate, is because the the system that you're outlining in that system, the if you said that God had first and second actuality, it would imply that God is imperfect has parts undergoes change right would, would i mean because for example um th these categories only apply to things that can be informed right that can un that, that can go from one state to another right and so god of course doesn't change doesn't undergo moving from one state to another right so the idea is that none of those things could in any way apply to god god's not even a, par a, a member of any a genus or species correct correct sure sure yeah gee, god god's God's not a genus like being or the good, but the, you know, where, where we'd have the point of departure is therefore is the, uh, the tight, strong rule. Is it like a strong nuclear force that if you actualize a potency, you're talking about change qua change. And you guys would say, no, there's a way to talk about actualizing a potency in God essence energies correct yes god's essence okay. never changes but there are he can do different actions Energy. yeah whereas we say no that that rule holds you know that it's 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 grounds for exactly interesting interesting discussion um you know and again you're not in the realm of i don't know catholic protestant debate where it's it it doesn't it's not i mean there's there's a lot of of depth to be plumbed there no, let's just say yeah, and I think, uh, you know, you and I, we, we may down the road, uh, you know, set up a, an, an in-person event if we, if we want to in maybe, yeah, you know, five or six cool. months or whatever. Yeah, so we can probably go into all that when we do that. Um, where you have a, where you have the good, the reason I, I, I really like in-person debates is because you have a beer beforehand or a meal or something, go debate, have a beer or a meal afterwards, you know, like a, like a meal sandwich. And, uh, you know, end capper. So you you know, if if everyone's entering it with with um, goodwill and everything, it's it's really a a, a win win. And I, I yeah, I was I actually really going to invite yours you via Zoom to come in there and eat the dinner with me after this, and I'll just have, <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. no, I mean yeah, that that defeats the whole purpose. Uh, yeah, it's much better. Uh, you know, in person. And I think when we were uh, batting this idea around what last year, the year before, it was uh, right in the middle of the coof and. Everything was crazy. Um, thank God all that nonsense is done with. So, you know, it'd be a lot more uh, viable in the next few months for sure. It's done for now. It's done for well, now. Well, yeah, it may come back. Exactly. Yeah. And I would imagine on, uh, I've seen a few of your episodes. Um, 
since you know we've kind of been uh re in contact again uh I, you know i think pretty much on all the social and, and political like we're probably on the same page on a lot of that stuff so uh you know again I, that's why i thought it'd be uh, beneficial to have you on and get your take on this stuff um i've got a couple questions that don't relate to anything controversial in terms of essence energy or anything like that that i have wondered um myself as a thomas that i was hoping you could help me with is that is that okay yeah, of course and we, we don't have to stop talking about, um, you know, if you wanted to go into more of the modes of composition or anything like that. So one topic that's pretty um, nifty and, and, and niche is what's Thomas's view of uh, the status of universals. So some of the people that I've read classify him as a moderate realist, and some of them classify him as more of a... Um, a, almost a proto uh nominalist like nominalist. he's yeah so yeah. uh what, can you help with that because uh this is uh, i'm seeing scholars all over the place on that and this is it matters to me because it's a really important issue when it comes to christology because we know that a lot of the church fathers especially in a couple of councils will refer to uh, christ assuming universal human nature so yes. that's why i it matters to me um but yeah, yeah, what yeah. what can you help us with uh, thomas's position who are you reading that – there's there's a lot um, there's so, a lot of names you could drop that, that count him as uh, almost a, no, a proto-nominalist. Uh, uh, I don't remember if it was Kretzmann, uh, Kretzmann or uh, Stump. One of the two in the Cambridge Companion to Aquinas calls him basically some kind of a proto-nominalist. Um, I don't remember what Whipple says. I've got Whipple with me here. And I've read yeah, a lot Whipple, of – Whipple will have him. It's, that, that's, that's good you've read Nipple, uh, Whipple. Yeah. That, that's uh i've read nipple too uh and yeah, yeah i mean i must prefer nipples take on no, i'm just sure whole different context <laughs> uh no whipple uh, whipples whipple would not have him near uh nominal. i i i have him uh strongly pegged as a moderate realist okay so there's a, yeah there's there's another guy who has him as a moderate realist i think uh at out of uh purdue um i forget that guy's name but it's another paper i was just re reading but go ahead yeah so uh, I don't. I think the case is really hard to make that that um, he's anomalous. I, you know, I have. If I knew we were going to go here, I have. Uh, I had basically a whole class. Well, just okay, yeah. I'd, I'd I'd love to talk to you about it in detail on, on another one. A separate stream, I, okay. Yeah. I, well, I mean, I I have the receipts. I I think strongly he's a moderate realist. I mean, is that that enough for now? We can Yeah, so like there's you have a to look at the text that these right. these nominalists. So I studied under under um Father Kevin Flannery, very very good dude, very good Jesuit, one of the good ones at the Greg and um man, he's just he's all over this. Um you know, we we went through I was taking it one in one semester Aristotle's metaphysics Thomas on Aristotle's metaphysics and then at the Angelicum which is a short walk away uh Thomas in Islam which was just an amazing amazing class um, and uh with father father Elul and so I was doing a lot of metaphysics and it was amazing it was really good stuff and so that was my introduction to the frightening and I think um scandalizing notion that there are people out there that it was Catholics, Catholics out there that are trying to read Thomas as a proto nominalist. And I, I just, I, I, you know, I, I needed a fainting couch and smelling salts. Um, but yeah, so we should, we should do that some other time, the case against Thomas as anomalous. The, yeah. the difficulty always arises from, I mean, by way of analogy, it's always difficult to parse how. Well, that, that analogy would just make it more abstruse. Yeah, let, let, let's let's. Well, let me give an example. Time. So there's a, there's yeah. a guy's paper, uh, the, the most recent one I read, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Brower from Purdue. And his paper, he argues that uh, Aquinas is a via, uh, uh, a, a middle way between, middle way yeah, yeah, between um, Occam's straight up nominalism versus uh, he picks another medieval figure, Champeau. And he talks about Champeau's realism, uh, where there is a, a real existence of universal natures. Aquinas has a via uh, media between um, uh, each human being having its own nature uh, and then sharing that in common. But there's not an actual participation of the individuals in some uh, in some ontological sense. Is is that would you think that's the right uh, reading of Thomas? Let me see if I can put this uh, graph that he has up because this is really relevant in terms of 
uh, patristic debates. This is why I keep bringing this up. Hmm. Let me um, show you what I mean here. Um, do you have the chat here? Because uh, I'm going to put it on the screen for everybody, but you might, might not be able to see the screen. My computer's um, over here. So, yeah, I'll just be looking over here. Okay, so I'll put this. So here it is on the screen for everybody in the the video audience. And then for you, here is the chat. Hopefully it'll let me share the image on chat. Sometimes I get frisky about this. They won't let me. Oh, come on now. Don't do this. All right, so... Let me link you the paper. If you scroll down to um, page, I just want your, it's not a trap. It's not, it's just it's page 19. I want your take on this because uh, you definitely know what you're talking about. So if you, if you look at that guy's paper <clears throat> in that link there and you go down to oh, page. Oh, I, I have to click on the link. Sorry. Yeah. I have like two desks. I have to, hold on. Let me get my mouse. So if you go down to page 19, there's a chart that he has where he kind of sketches out. Um, and I want you to tell me if you 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 believe that that is Aquinas's position there in that middle part of the chart that he has. <clears throat> where is it in the chat here? So I don't, I don't usually run my own board here. So if you go to the Zoom chat right there, uh, uh -huh. you'll see that link to that philosophy paper at Purdue Philosophy Archive. Zoom has its own kind of internal chat. I can give it to you on Twitter if you if that'd be better. Yeah, can you? Can you? Yeah. Sorry, I'm, sure. I'm kind of a boomer with running it's okay. this as I'm on. I am too. <laughs> so it's it's tough. My my wife usually runs it. She she went down to finish dinner. Yeah, here it comes. Yeah, so just scroll down uh, in that link to page 19. You'll see this little chart that he drew. <clears throat> And uh, just whatever, you, tell me what you think if you think that's accurate or if it's kind of off. Okay. Let's see. I'm interested. I'm waiting with. H is presumably H1, H2. That's like individual human beings, right? Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so H is like human nature, and then in the notion of I yeah, individual, individual gotcha. humans, exactly. Right. Aquinas is the immediate. Um, hold on, I gotta read a little bit above here. Bring out the significance of all this for Aquinas' solution to the medieval problem of universals. Let us refer one final time to the comparison of his views with those of Shampoo and Occam. Consider, therefore, the following diagram, which contrasts their respective views of species membership for the political, uh, particular case of Socrates and Plato. Yeah, so, so in Champeau's realism, you should also look at Abelard. Abelard is mm -hmm. not known as proto -nom proto proto nominalist, and he really is. Abelard yeah, is uh, that's my understanding. I have a book I was going to recommend to those that uh, in the audience that they're interested that gets into some of that. But go ahead. So according to this diagram, uh, so, so both, I, right, right. So it's very nominalistic because you have individuator one and two both participating in the same humanity. Yeah, uh, but H1 and H2 in the Via Medea, via don't, Media. They don't, yeah, they don't actually like, there's no ontological link between H1 and H2, right? So would the link only be conceptual? Uh, if I recall, I think that's what Kretzmann argues. I don't think the link is only conceptual. Uh, okay. This is a good question. This is a good question. I'm going to have to go back to how familiar are you with with um, um, the Dante at Essentia number three and four? Really, the third chapter of Dante at Essentia three and four. Like when, actually, even if you go to D the Dante number two, Jay, and you uh, Socrates uh, prescinding from man as mm -hmm. man, he goes mm -hmm. through that whole thing. That's that's the best place. To, it's very technical. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, go through the Deante too, where he's going through preci precision from man. It's it's that's his answer to all of this. Okay. I I, I don't think I want to try to do it here. That's but fine. Yes, this looks like an um, this looks like a I think a non-controversial uh, take. This okay. H one. An individuator, one H two individual. Right. I'll have to think about it more, though, to be honest. Yes, and my concern is because, to my uh, reading of uh, Cappadocian, Cyril, 
Maximus and up into even the Seventh Council, it seems to me, it's particularly St. Theodore, the way he argues at the Seventh Council, it seems to me like the, the councils and those fathers are, are uh, pretty much on the same page as Champeau, and that's my concern. Um, there's a book by Zakuber that just came out about this very issue too, which I haven't, I got the book, I haven't read it yet, but, uh, well, I read the chapter on, um, John Damascus, but, um, so there's a whole domain where people are discussing this issue because as you can see, it's going to relate to Christology. Now there's a section in the Summa where Thomas says, um, Christ is the head of all men. And uh, sometimes Catholics will point to this, particularly if they're more Eastern minded to try to deal with this, this theological question, because if Christ is uh, assuming universal human nature, then what does it mean when Aquinas says he's the head of all men? And that's going to hinge on Aquinas's view of universals is why it's an issue. Anyway, separate topic. We'll do a whole other stream on that. Um, Look also, at the yep. Dante. It's, it's really unfun. Uh, you get through the, the first mini chapter on the Dante, and then two, it's all this uh, man as uh, taken as a universal, man taken as particular, and the mm -hmm. concept of pre pre precision, prescinding from. That's this is this is where he gets really specific on this. And if you, I'll, I'll, I could talk about it more. I, I'm gonna I want to go relook at it though. Oh, that's great. We'll we'll do we'll just do something on the future on that. Now, um, is there anything else you want to uh, get to in terms of going back to the main topics tonight? Our, our five things that uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to give a gloss on uh, a point I think is vastly underrepresented, which is how all all of uh, the last two thousand years of Christian philosophy and and. It, pretty ecumenical way are really a footnote to Aristotle. And, and he had this same as, um, you know, Alfred North Whitehead wouldn't say that that's, it's all a footnote to Socrates, right? You have this almost grandfather, Socrates, father, Plato, son, Aristotle relationship, lots have commented on where they're all like braiding each other's hair and stuff. It, you know, Alfred North Whitehead and those who have popularized this notion styled it as the only way to think about the history of philosophy with plato being the the kind of man behind the man i i would just say no you know plato's kind of like a the first father figure to aristotle and socrates is the you know second father figure to aristotle and really all of western philosophy is a footnote to aristotle and that's why he's so important for us christians uh, whether you're whether you're Orthodox or you're Catholic, especially for Catholics, but I mean for for any of us who believe in the Eucharist, right? You, it's not like Aristotle uh, adduced out of whole cloth ex, ex nihilo this notion of prosenequivocity or hylomorphism in order to it, like a cope to explain this tricky concept of the Eucharist. You know, it was there and it was the account for reality. It was the account for meaningful change that Plato couldn't give 350 years before Christ. And then it also is the perfect coverer of the explanatory gap for the Eucharist. You know, one of the, the trickiest questions you're ever going to get spat at you by an atheist. That's so true. Could... Yeah. And uh, we we would agree to an extent with the Roman Catholic notion uh, and that the, the term transubst transubstantiation is used in some of the Orthodox documents. So we don't have a problem with that idea, and we would basically agree with the the idea, as laid out by Aristotle, that there is a substantial change that's going on here. The only one area I would take issue with that is just that in the Orthodox view, uh, coming out of uh, Cyril in particular, it's the energies that are also the key component to understanding the Eucharist as well. So Cyril, St. Cyril brings this in at Ephesus to explain that the change occurs via the deification of the human nature, via the energies, and the same human nature that's been deified in Christ is also um, energizing the Eucharistic elements. And so it is body, blood, soul, and divinity. We would agree with that phrase of the Roman Catholics. It's just that when we say divinity, it's not the divine essence. It's not a supernatural uh, created grace. It's a it's the uncreated energies that is the meant by that phrase divinity there. So not trying to spark an argument. I'm just saying that we agree with the there is a substantial change and uh, the accidents remain. Well, I think we can agree with that. That the phrase is used in some Orthodox theologians as well. So um, the only qualifier is just that we the energies come in there for us from Cyril uh, precisely because Cyril argues that the energies are used in the Eucharist. Yeah, 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 fair, 
fine. Fair enough. I, it's just, I, I just think it's interesting that, uh, that folks so vastly underrepresent this point that why were all the, you know, at Segovia, Spain, when they were having this, this, uh, you know, the digs at Spain and all the new Aristotelian texts were coming out and they were being argued about at the university of Paris that it's Aristotle. It's Aristotle that made all the difference for uh, really specifically for us Catholics. But well, uh, the same can be said in the sense of the uh, West in general, because <clears throat> if when you guys when you so it's Dr. James Lindsay, myself, and Stephen Coughlin. When this podcast comes out, you guys in the audience, you'll see this. So we actually go into this this book pretty uh, uh, ne- in a pretty hefty way, which is. Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition um, by Glenn McGee. And this is fascinating because it's pinpointing this point that Tim's making about the return of Neoplatonism. When Neoplatonism comes back in the Renaissance, you get all these Hermetic dudes like Giordano Bruno and all these weird, yeah. weird ideas. And they're reviving this stuff that leads to Hermeticism in the West. And it's revived the time of the Enlightenment in Hegel, yeah. as yeah. well as as well as other Enlightenment figures too, like Leibniz. But what they do is they're reviving Neoplatonism. And so Hegelianism is the Trinity as imminent process in the world working itself out. He doesn't actually believe in a transcendent God, except, I mean, maybe the father or the the first principle in Hegel is transcendent. I don't know. But regardless, it's an imminentized, pantheized uh, 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 Trinity that is is process, historical process. So, yeah, the Alfie bone, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it is histor- It is historical process embodied. Hegel tried to say, "I'm a, I'm been a Lutheran and I shall remain the same." But there's just no way. There's no way he can. And also, I wanted to just oh, add yeah. you add yeah, go ahead. Fortiore, what you said, Jay. Remember, like all these guys that that you're mentioning there, Giordano Bruno, all of the the ones, even Descartes, Bacon, even Locke. These guys are all corpuscularians. Like right. they believe in magic, magical atoms, the Royal Society and stuff. There's really, you could right. do a stream on this. It's interesting, interesting stuff, but it's all from rejecting the Aristotelian metaphysics for like the natural order. Um, Bacon's work is called the Novum Organum. He's saying we're doing new Aristotle. Both Descartes and Bacon said the project for the modern era will be eliminating formal and final cause from the world. Yes, I mean, exactly. Stop me when this sounds familiar. The, the world is now... It's dead, it's dead matter in process. And what happens is yeah. after Hegel, the uh, process philosophy of the, trin- the Trinity immanentized in the world, uh, you know, as we all know, Marx gets rid of the spirit and just says, oh, it's just matter. <laughs> so yeah. uh, world history is just world dialectic. And um, I'm glad you mentioned Luther. I forgot that. Yeah. So uh, th- there's a connection between Hegel's uh, background and, and Lutheranism. And if you guys haven't read uh, Dame Francis Yates's book, Rosicrucian Enlightenment, she argues that the earliest uh, Rose- uh, alchemists and Enlightenment philosophers were all steeped in Lutheran Rosicrucianism. In fact, Christian mm-hmm. Johann Andre was coming out of Lutheranism. And even though we might not, we could spe- we speculate that Luther's symbol is, you know, the the rose cross. Later Lutherans did actually appropriate uh, 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 when they became Rosicrucians the rosy cross to be their symbol out of Lutheranism. So Lutheranism has this undercurrent, uh, ironically, uh, right after maybe a generation after Luther for sure, uh, in terms of being uh, very much into Hermeticism and Neoplatonism, and so they they they're basically making what we would call, you know, the, the, we believe it's a transcendent theology of the Trinity. They're taking it and putting it into the world and making Trinity just like natural process. And then they believe that science is the study of this process in the natural world. So they're just making Trinity into a technology of scientific Gnostic process. Yeah, the Alphibung is just, you know, position, negation, synthesis, this explains everything in the world. This explains God. This explains, you know, wh- whether you like Coke or Pepsi, from the great to the small. Uh, the German idealists are are just repackaging. They they claim to be the first thing after the Enlightenment, post Enlightenment, but they're just repackaging the creepy Enlightenment corpuscularianism. It is all immanentism, like you said. Yes, we agree there. And my view is that scientism emerges out of this stuff. 
I don't know. Agree. Like, okay. Yeah. We're royal but, society, man. Yeah, the royal they're society, all, exactly. All they're all, yeah. yeah, they're all part of this uh, materialistic, you know, uh, empiricist dialectical philosophy. Do you want to go to the super chats? It's been a great discussion. I don't want to keep you too long. Um, if there's anything else you want to add, you can. Or if not, we'll go to super chats. Sure. Let's let yeah. Let's go to them. We'll. Uh, I'll, I'll. Yeah. Excellent. If you guys uh, would, uh, you can support the show through the super chat functions, which is Streamlabs. I was, uh, as everybody knows, demonetized in 2019, so. Uh, none of that's on YouTube, but we have Streamlabs, so you can go to Streamlabs right there and support the show that way. Ask your questions to Tim. Tim is a uh, specialist. He does know these areas very well. And so if you do have specific questions you'd like him to ask, feel free to ask them via Super Chat. I'm not going to be reading the chat. Uh, I'm only going to be reading the Super Chat questions. So the first one comes from uh, Rough Hands, $10. <clears throat> I've always wanted to see you two together. And uh, quite frankly, as well. Well, I just found out that we both uh, are buds with uh, our buddy Frank. I didn't know that uh, Tim knew Frank, so Frank knows uh, Tim as well. So, yes, we have uh, mutual buds there. Uh, it would be a great show. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do any shows anytime. Uh, Frank did message me today or yesterday or today, uh, by the way, that he and I are going to be doing several podcasts in I think J January, De December, January, somewhere in there, maybe February. But uh, Frank's got a whole list of topics. He wants to go through uh, Brave New World. He wants to go through uh, C.S. Lewis Space Trilogy, which we covered a couple months ago. Um, so Frank's got a whole bunch of stuff he wants to do. And yeah, if, if Tim wants to join, he's more than welcome as well. Yeah, Frank just said that he wanted to, because uh, I'm, I'm doing some C.S. Lewis book club with him, and then you're oh, doing cool. one either right before or right after. And he's like, oh, maybe we could all do. So some of the other stuff we were texting about the... Uh, um, you know, I asked you if you'd seen the, I figured you had seen that video. You said, yeah, this is. Oh yeah. 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 The, 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 uh, Fagan and, um, uh, the day tapes. I, I'm, I'm really behind cause I meant to been, I meant to cover the day tapes for years and I've just never got around to it because they're four hours long and you have to, I mean, I've been through all of the day tapes twice, but that was like four years ago. So I need to go back to those. And, uh, yeah, if, if you want to join for any of that, you can too, too as well, or we can do it on Frank's, whatever is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So thank you for that rough hands. You go on to say, uh, debates are important, but I think that these types of streams from time to time are good and productive. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, it's good Me to too. do both. Me too. Gim Torden, <laughs> he's flipped your name instead of Tim Gordon. Gim Torden, $1. What is eating uh, Gilbert Gripe? I'm guessing that's <laughs> I'm guessing that's a takeoff on Gripers, but uh, Panos for $3. What are your thoughts on the anthropic principle i don't know if this is in relation to me or to tim oh excuse me tim tim what is your view on the anthropic principle in relation to hylomorphism uh can you stipulate that a little bit how how would it relate to hylomorphism what is he what do you what do you think he means there uh I don't, I, I, I'm not, so Pano's a buddy. I don't know that. I mean, it's not like he's not trying to trip you up. I'm not sure. So for example, anthropic principle is very important in Maximus. So he may be thinking of the fact that like in Maximus's theology, um, because man is the microcosm of the macrocosm and ultimately Christ is the, the ultimate, uh, archetype of micro macro. So maybe he's saying that everything kind of relates to, uh, Christ in terms of the anthropic principle in St. Maximus, but hylomorphism is just the idea that, you know, m uh, matter is informed, right, by form. Um, so maybe he, I don't know. Uh, Pano, can you message me if you want to qualify that question and I'll bring it up later. Um, so DM me on uh, Telegram or something like that if you want to fill out that question more. We'll move on and come back to that. Uh, Pano, are you, if you're there, just message me on uh, Telegram. BMX. 1966 great video 25 dollars. well thank you uh so much long time super chatter long time supporter we love bmx 1966 shout out to bmx justin martyr three dollars could you go into the similarities or the differences between orthodox and predestination uh, as regards to the eastern fathers they sometimes sound like arminians and Thomas sometimes, uh, I guess he means like Calvinists. Um, it's hard for me to parse this out. Well, I'll let uh, Tim, if he wants to comment on the Thomistic view of uh, predestination and election, if he wants to. Ooh, well, with regard to, I mean, Tom, Thomas basically gives it to, 
uh, Augustine here. So yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure where. Uh, yeah, so the Thomistic position is pretty much in Lagrange's book, Predestination, right? I mean, would you would you say Lagrange is like a pretty tight. standard yeah, kind of? Tight. Yeah, yeah. Thomas is really straightforward on this, and uh, yeah, I think I think I don't think it's too disputed, right? I think Lagrange is just say kind of expositing this is this is the standard fare. Yeah, my my reading of Augustine and of, of Aquinas and Lagrange is what Tim said that it's pretty clear that there is an unconditional election. Um, there's operative grace, uh, which is in uh, Augustine. Uh, Aquinas picks up, if I recall, operative grace. The difference between the Orthodox view and that is that we tend to not make any statements about w to what degree it's an individual election. And we typically speak of election through the eyes of Christology. So, for example, you know, Paul's epistles, he's um, writing to a visible community and he's calling the entire visible community the elect. I'm not saying that Thomism or Augustinianism would deny the corporate election. I know they have that position uh, as well. But typically, uh, the Thomistic or the Augustinian position will try to read it sort of like from the divine vantage point. And that's the uh, their reading of Romans 9. <clears throat> and the Orthodox view sees it more as a first and foremost collective in that uh, the election is all in Christ. And in terms of individuals, it's based on how they actualize the potential, <laughs> to use the phraseology of uh, Maximus, to appropriate grace. So the grace is present there for everyone. Um, there's not really, to my knowledge, operative grace anywhere in Orthodox theology because we always stress uh, synergy on the basis of the Sixth Council, on the basis of Christology. So that would be the difference uh, in terms of that we don't make the types of statements that you see in, I think, question 23 of the Summa, part one. Brad, $10. For Tim, how do you manage uh, staying Catholic uh, in all seriousness? I have a child. Uh, I have children like you. How do you and your family... How do you keep yourself in your family? I don't, nobody, I'm not putting anyone up to this. This is just people's comments. Well, yeah, uh, simple a principle of sufficient reason, right? I, I'm, I'm presuming this has something to do with Pope Francis. Yeah, I imagine he's saying, yeah, like Francis the heinousness of, of the heinousness of Francis. Well, uh, our Lord, um, principle of sufficient reason, right? Gave us gave us what we needed to forbear even a pope like this and uh of course there's always the retrospective hope that uh you know maybe we're in some sort of avignon papacy but it's really not for us to decide you know like gandalf says if if francis is indeed the pope which seems to be the position i'll take um at least for now then we we've been given sufficient grace to withstand it and there's sufficient reason to believe it uh, to, to to continue believing in the precepts of the church and uh, the marks of the church, even through a truly, truly, truly uniquely horrible pontificate. Yeah, I wasn't laughing at your reply. I was laughing at you said game. You mentioned Gandalf and stuff. So anytime somebody brings up Lord of the Rings, I, I do my uh, uh, Hobbit impressions. And so they're taking the papacy to Mordor, Mr. Frodo. Sam! Sam! I can't resist. So um, that's why I was laughing. Had nothing to do with laughing at you or anything. So, uh, well, we're in a bind. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give it. They've, to they're taking the papacy to Mordor, right? Yeah, <laughs> they're yeah, taking feels... the papacy to Mordor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So even Legolas gets guys in guard. Palantir, one dollar. Thank you for the stream, guys. Question to both of you: Could God have actualized worlds? Uh, other than this world, if he did not, wouldn't that mean that there is potentia as he did not actualize other worlds? What is your view, the Thomistic view of this? Man, these are, these are heavy duty. Qu I don't, I don't get super chats like, this. well, I mean, you're talking <laughs> in some Leibnizian best of all possible <laughs> universes or like a multiverse. No, he just thing. means in the sense of possible worlds, like, um, could could other uh, like Phaser talks about this in the chapter I think on uh, in his five proofs book on um, it's either the Thomist chapter of the five proofs or the Neoplatonic chapter I think it's the Thomist chapter and he says uh, that in in his argumentation that there are other possible worlds that could have been created that that God didn't create so in other words I, as far as I understand Phaser he's not affirming like multiverse or anything like that so 
Um, do you think there are possible worlds that God could have created that he didn't is the question? Yeah, I'll have to think about that one. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't, it, if so, it wouldn't mean that there's, I mean, we wouldn't say that then God suffers from a, a, uh, an unactualized potency simply because the world is this way and not, not, uh, some other way, you know, I, I don't, I don't think it poses a theological problem. Do you? Well, I, I mean, I, for, this is one of the arguments. I didn't put this person up to this. I'm just saying this is one of the points where we would make, we would say, yeah, there is first and second actuality in God. And it's an argument that the uh, Cappadocians make, actually. So that's, we would, we would say, yeah, there is. And this is precisely where the energies and, or uh, capacities come in, right? There's, God has the capacity to do different things. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. Well, you, then you're, then you're in the realm of um, effects right you're in the wrong no but for us it's not just effects it's actual it's the so we don't have it in a two-tiered like cause and effect like because we're all there's the 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 middle term and the, the middle term there is the energy so for us god does different acts um and he has different energies so not trying to call not trying to be contentious just saying that that's the position that we have yeah, we, yeah. i have to hold to that because yeah i get you i get you so what the the fundamental like baseline for Catholics is when you say like God is actus purus, right? Which that, that, that is an area of a genuine point of departure. Right. Well, not talking about, we God's. do believe God's pure act, by the way. So if you read, uh, John Damascus, he says, God is pure act. If you read Maximus, God, he says pure, pure act. But the, if you look at the 200 chapters where he covers in the first five pages, St. Maximus says there's two senses in which we predicate pure act of God. The one sense is that, uh, he is pure act only in contrast to creatures and so creatures are composed right all of these things that you mentioned the six points about uh you know the modes uh of composition oh, yeah. when maximus covers that in the first five uh, pages of the tenor chapters he says god is uh not composed of matter form not uh, uh part of any genera species he's not uh, subject uh, he's not substance and accidents he says however we do not predicate uh, pure actuality of god in terms of his essence he says this only applies to naming him in contrast to creatures, and so he makes this a distinction between the theology proper and economia, and thence, thus, Maximus is, uh, you know, constant argumentation for the energies. For him, the energies are the many things around God. Sure. So for, for, for us, for there us, is, <clears throat> yeah. For us, that's that would be a distinction without a difference. We'd say, look, if you say that uh, there are act just because God could have made different decisions along the order of creation to say that there are that would mean that there are non-actualized potencies in god correct uh, we, we would say nay you know then, then that would mean that god has to be changing so this is paradigmatic what where do you set the baseline and for us since we start with a look at at the nature of god you know uzia we'd say well, if he's un unchanging, we work from there. And when you work from the immu immutability principle, you just say, well, there's no, there's no potency. And so th then you get this kind of, you don't really get this when you have Catholic Protestant uh, apologetics because you, you, they tend to borrow heavily from our uh, paradigms. Yeah, but correct. When, you, you know, when you're talking about these, we're talking two different paradigms. I, I don't know how to give a, an answer that would uh, you know in, in 30 seconds for a super chat that would yeah we'll satisfy. we'll uh, i mean if we if we do set up an in-person debate i'm sure we'll, we'll be touching on all that stuff down the road but uh for those in the audience that look are looking for the orthodox answer to that specific question it's in dr bradshaw's uh book aristotle east and west which is precisely about how the east read aristotle in this way the west read aristotle in this way but the primary point of commonality that we stress tonight is that both the east and the west uh definitely have a important approach and reading to aristotle in fact there's a whole other academic text that we didn't even get into tonight which in fact uh, which deals with the notion of person for the orthodox church the distinction between nature and person is so uh fundamental and so paradigmatic almost uh, guess where the origins of this come out of in terms of individuation aristotle if you read uh, Terescu's uh, PhD thesis on uh, Nyssa and the concept of the divine persons, he says that really the locus of this for the Orthodox is coming out of Aristotle. Now you can't note, uh, uh, you can't equate in a one-to-one -one way the uh, individuation pro uh, principle of substance in Aristotle to a person 
or hypostasis, but it is basically coming out of that. It's not neoplatonic hypostasis. That's totally different. It's the principle of individuation for the subject or agent that uh, the agent that's also Aristotelian, right? And so when that's appropriated by John Damascus and by Maximus, but mainly by John Damascus, I mean, he really takes the person nature distinction, utilizing a lot of these Arist uh, Aristotelian concepts as well. So uh, totally different point, totally different topic, but uh, maybe some other time we'll get into that. Anonymous, $3. What is your opinion of uh, Father Hears? He made a video saying philosophy is useless and contrary to orthodoxy. I assume you're asking me that. What And that we shouldn't study philosophy uh, or anything non-orthodox. Is this a common view amongst orthodox priests? So I know Father Peter Hears very well. I've known him for many years. Uh, typically when he makes statements like this, I think he's meaning that secular philosophy, academia, the, the world of philosophy is more or less useless. In other words, if you go to a university and you study philosophy, uh, they're going to try to brainwash you. They're going. The Tucker just had somebody on yesterday, I think, talking about how uh, some blonde chick, I forget her name, but she was talking about how universities are just brainwashing centers now. So yeah. I know that Fa Father Peter Hears means that in that sense. I know he doesn't mean that all philosophy in some like Protestant evangelical sense is uh, useless because they just printed um, the, I, I thought I had it, I don't have it over here, but they just printed uh, the Apodictic Treatise, right? If you read the introductory essay, which is written by my friend, uh, Father Moody, who translated the Apodictic Treatise, he points out that the Orthodox position is not anti-philosophy, anti-logic. Uh, this is a misunderstanding because the logic throughout the Apodictic Treatise is St. Gregory Palamas using Aristotelian logic. So this would be absurd to say out of hand that all philosophy is... I think he's talking about all worldly philosophy. And that's what Paul says. The philosophy of the fallen world is vain. It's not philosophy itself that is vain. Again, guys, come on. And this is a big problem in orthodoxy that we've been bitching about and calling out for years now. In the Fount of Knowledge, the whole book is St. John Damascus pointing out the right use of philosophy. How many of the apologists use philosophy? How many of the Cappadocians use philosophy? To out of hand say philosophy is not orthodox is just retarded and silly. So uh, I hope nobody is falling into this mistake here. Um, anyway, I don't I don't know if the if you're saying that if you can if you want to comment on that you can. But I don't not know. like a good answer. Yeah, I mean my my latest book with Dr. Michael Robillard of you know my my good buddy from he's an Oxford Navy SEAL uh, philosopher is called don't go to college and it's based on this idea he went on tucker and and was saying this oh cool i'm sorry i didn't i didn't even know you had a book out my bad i would have put it in the show description i'll add it later but uh yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's you know it's it's recent it's it's not relevant to this stuff we're just we're literally saying it's regnary press don't go to college and it expresses stands for the proposition that you were you're using to parse um what what this priest probably meant rhetorically which i strongly agree with like you're not going to go to college and, and go to even even most Catholic colleges. You're not going to go to college and, and get a, a good expression of the Western tradition of philosophy. So we call right. it a case for case for revolution. Yeah, Dr. Michael Robillard went on Tucker Tucker's Day Show, and Tucker said uh, this this tickled tickled him in all the right places. <laughs> I won't, I won't use the expression he actually used because it was off camera but um <laughs> yeah uh i don't even know if i should have said that but yeah yeah of course it's like you, you're just going to be indoctrinated dude. exactly yeah great point the institutions have been stormed man yeah and, and that's something that we've talked about over here as well uh you guys remember we've done many uh interviews with people uh, richard grove right i mean richard's uh a big part of the, what he was doing for many years was promoting the work of John Taylor Gatto and Charlotte Iserbid, the Dumbing Down of America and all this stuff. Um, we did many interviews with Brett Vinat uh, of uh, School Sucks, right, years ago. So, you know, guys, we've been talking about that for a long time, and, uh, and I hope you guys don't misunderstand that. when we It's it'd be like saying universities are brainwashing. Oh, so you're against education. No, I'm talking about universities right. as they are, right? So let's not get tripped up on words. Uh, Mr. Lofton, $20 says, thank you for this charitable stream. Very nuanced chat. Mr. Dyer and Mr. Gordon, please debate me on reason and theology live. Well, thank you for that super chat, Mr. Lofton, but something tells me that's not the real Mr. Lofton. So. Is that your friend Mario, Jay? Uh, 
Don't know he who it is. It's a hilarious impression, it's... by the way. So... <laughs> Uh, well, he did do great, and he, he his is closer to the real, uh, actual voice of Lofton. But I kind of like my Lofton, like rapper Lofton, uh, in terms of my aesthetic, better. But, um, but he definitely has the voice down. So shout out to Mario for that. Um, all right. Uh, oh, wait, here's so Pano left me a message here to clarify his super chat. Let's see what he says. study the ancient philosophers intimately so this is yes this is good point pano thank you for that so that was a point about uh studying philosophy yeah saint nectarios was uh, had a giant library and said philosophy is not the problem it's uh, the misuse of it so um let's see pano says i'm uh asking a general comment about the anthropic principle to see if tim has any uh take on it in my mind this is the related to christology and the logi as the as Christological, but I was curious to see if he has any comments from a Thomistic perspective. In the background of my mind, the Cappadocian appropriation of hylomorphism would be Christological via the Logi and the energies. Um, I don't think they would be using hylomorphism. Uh, so um, in Pelican's book, he goes through every bit of the Cappadocian use of Greek philosophy uh and maybe pano you might be thinking of something i don't remember but i don't remember them them using holomorphism because that's just that's just matter being informed being informed being oppressed upon by the form yeah but he's not he's not confining uh, a sincere question he's not confining hylomorphism to christology alone he's saying it it, it applies equally to Christology and uh, humans and plants and all things, right? I mean, this is just a question of clarification. Sounds like he's centering uh, Christology on centering hylomorphism on Christology. I don't. I don't think that's that's anyone's view. Of it. So I'm just. A he's saying wrong. so in the background of my mind. If the if oh he's not saying they did this a Cappadocian. Uh, oh, I see what you're asking. You're saying like. How would, if we, uh, if our theology, Trinitarian theology is primarily Cappadocian, how would we understand an appropriation of hylomorphism? So actually, Sherard has a critique of this, and uh, I think it's the essay that he did on uh, Aristotle, immortality. He critiques Aristotle in regard, uh, in regard to how hylomorphism wouldn't work in Christology, and he says that... Um, you have to qualify it and this actually relates to the question that we didn't get into tonight pano but i was i was asking because of the shampoo realism right because the argument uh, sherard is making is that if you have this approach to uh, if you have the hylomorphic view and you apply it to christology it's going to mess up christ being uh the universal assuming universal human nature that's the issue here but i don't know how it would work in terms of cappadocian appropriation i'd have to look at this is actually touched on in uh, pelican's book uh on the metamorphosis of natural theology i just don't remember how he how he uh cashes it out anyway we'll bring that up next time it's a really deep topic and i know tim probably needs to go and he did want to uh, maybe in the future discuss um the expositing of, of Aquinas's view of universals because that's going to play into this question so um, anything you want to leave us with Tim uh, no, thanks for doing this sorry I, I get uh, old neck injury so I'm not I'm not rolling my eyes when I do that I, I, when I do a stream I don't do long ones as long as you Jay and when I do uh, about an hour I start getting this you get a neck, cramp in my neck. Yeah, yeah but, but um, uh, thanks a lot for doing it I think it's th the way forward we we can do an in-person thing i think would be cool and have a beer or two sure and thanks for hosting me please uh you know guys follow me on twitter timo theology with two e's and and uh, check out my youtube channel uh i do have the channel linked and i'll add your twitter as well so thanks i have four books and a lot of them are oh, stuff okay. that, that you'd you'd like jay rules okay. for retrogrades is one uh catholic republic is more political than uh then it might sound the, the third one is the case for patriarchy making a a, a case i think well, we definitely agree with that one yeah 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 and then don't go to college just regnery this is my first we agree one with that one <laughs> yeah okay yeah. awesome yeah. yeah so check out tim's books guys if you're interested yeah go ahead 
Yeah, I was just going to say, I think we were both at the November Stop the Steal in D.C., Jay. Were you at that one or are you at... Uh, no, I was only in Atlanta because I talked to um, Alex and them. And, Ollie, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I yeah. wanted to go down there and uh, meet Alex in person because I'd never i been hosting a little bit uh, of the fourth hour, but I hadn't met Alex in person. So I met yeah. Alex at the... And then I met Nick, too, at the one in Atlanta, and that was it. Oh, okay. Never mind then. Yeah, we we were, uh, met your boy. I don't know. Do you ever do anything with uh, Roosh V? He's- so uh, Roosh and I did one interview. Um, I mean, we're friendly, but uh, last I heard, Roosh said he wanted to n- not do as much internet stuff. So he kind of like wanted to, I think, focus on you know uh, devotional sort of personal. I know he was spending a lot of time in the monastery. I'm not, I'm not criticizing him at all. I'm just saying what, what he was saying. So he, he wanted to move away from doing a lot of online content. So we haven't really chatted in a couple months, but, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're buddies. Yeah. For some so reason, I thought, I thought you were at the November, the, what was it? November the 14th stop this deal. I was out there. I locked eyes with Fuentes. We we're, I, I was going to walk over and try to shake his hand. And then I, I saw my corner, the corner of my eye. A bearded guy. Oh, you a, saw Roosh there? <laughs> a big wooden cross. Yeah, and someone came up behind me. I wasn't sure it was Roosh. Someone said, oh, can I get a photo with Tim Gordon and Roosh? And I was like, oh, Roosh. I, very, <laughs> very nice, soft-spoken man. Um, and it said, I, I figured you knew decently well. So I, I thought you were there for some reason. But yeah, we were at the November Stop the Steal. And I hosted a Baton Rouge Stop the Steal a couple weeks before that. Oh, interesting. Where what was the where was the one in November? Was that Phoenix? Or no, was that, that was DC. DC. Oh, okay. That was DC. Someone told me you were there, and I was like, oh, I would have tried to shake his hand too. I didn't uh, actually. I was know. only. I think so. There was a clip uh, uh, that people thought was DC, but it was outside of the Atlanta uh, courthouse or whatever. With you and Fuentes meeting up or something? Well, I met up with Alex, and then Nick oh. came and met up with Alex, and we did a tv or uh, one of the episodes of alex's show so okay. that's how that's how i met up with nick but originally it was just i was there to meet up with alex everyone thought that was dc and i, I literally thought it from later that no night. it was like, atlanta oh. yeah because exactly. i don't like we we heard about that and then just decided to go down to atlanta because i'm not that far from atlanta it's about a four or five hour drive but yeah i hate dc and i hate driving to dc it's a nightmare yeah yeah well all right, man. Thanks. Thanks yeah, again for doing absolutely. this. Absolutely. Uh, guys, if you're interested, uh, go follow uh, Tim over at his uh, uh, social medias 